Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's go, Bobby, let's go. What's up, what's up, what's up? Let's go, quickly, let's go. Let's go, Harry, oh, let's go. I know your feet hurt right now, girl. Let's go, your feet going to hurt tomorrow. Come on, fellas, hurry up, let's go. John Bailey's been invited to spend a few days at Olympic High, a 2,000 student school, once the worst performer in Charlotte. It's been turned round by Principal Pamela Espinosa, who's keen to keep up the momentum of change. We went from a failing school to a good school, but good is not good enough today. So what's the problem? The predictions are that you're, the standard of living in America will decrease if we do not pretty dramatically change our educational system. The problem is students are being passive learners versus active learners. Um, and they do a good job of what I call strategic compliance. They do what the teacher has them do and makes them do, but they're not, their passions are not engaged. Last year, Pamela took the controversial step of breaking Olympic into five small schools, each with its own principal, all on one site. She hopes the changes she's introducing will help give students the critical learning skills she believes are essential for economic success. Each of those schools are theme-based with a career theme, um, except for one that's more of an integrated studies theme. Um, you will see a stronger relationship. Kids feel like they're taken care of better. They feel like teachers care about them. Teachers are collaborating more. So we see some of the beginnings. Five years from now, when you walk into this building, I hope you will not see too many teachers standing at the front of the classroom. And we've been talking about transforming the school and what you want here. Um, what can I do to help? One of the things that we're really looking at is how do you go from being that teacher at the front of the classroom delivering the information to getting your kids really actively engaged. And so I think any work that you can do along that line will help. Dania, if you can move up a seat. The first teacher Bailey sees trying to actively engage her students is history specialist Elizabeth Smith. All right. Her biggest challenge currently is a very mixed ability class of 14-year-olds. How many of you read the chapter over the weekend? All right, all right, we have one taker. Okay, good. I would, hi I would highly encourage you to read the chapter, okay? That way, when we go over the notes and stuff, you're really just reinforcing. It's a topic about ancient Greece, and she's experimenting with active learning but it's a struggle. Right here. What you're going to do is you're going to take notes as if I were talking. You're going to write down what Hakeem tells us. OK, go, buddy. The size of the area is 50,000 5, square miles of territory. Good, 50,000 square miles. Uh, Ionia is on Turkey. Mycena is on one half of the peninsula on the southern end of Greece. Hey, you guys need to be taking down the notes, just as if I were talking. What well, we just write that down? That's on the overhead? Uh-huh. You probably know a little bit more uh, about your topic than if I had told you, right? Okay. Not really. <laughs> You'd rather I just yammer on? Yeah. <laughs> that way we get everything. Okay, well, we'll make sure we get everything. All right. You said to her, what was it, would you rather I was just yammering on? And she, she said, yeah. <laughs> well, they do. See, the smarter kids do. The really smart kids. Give me, give me what I need to know. Because I want to I wanna buzz through it, I want to read it, and I want to make an A. Mm -hmm. Go a little slower, okay? And we'll see if we can get it right, okay? The civilization was spread into southern and western Europe, India, and Iran. Chris, also pause a little bit. All right. Give them a minute to get it down. This is something I would like to revisit a number of times and have more student-centered note giving. Okay. Now, I, I don't think it was a um, I don't think it was a, a full success, but you could see they actually were starting to gain steam. We're trying to find ways to get these children engaged. What do you think? Do you think, it's, um, do you think it's a new way of learning that's appropriate for everyone? 
or do you think it's something that we're having to do in order to try and include turned off kids? I don't know. I really, I don't know. I've tried it both ways. Sometimes I'm surprised by who likes it and who doesn't. Um, I just don't know. Some, uh, I, I feel that it's, it's worth a try. Okay. Just along the corridor, a first year history teacher has taken the concept of active learning to another level. Hold it up, go. It's a lesson about the Italian Renaissance, and former lawyer Alan Vitali is illustrating the revolutionary impact of semaphore. Well done, well done. <laughs> the semaphore is a way to pass messages much faster uh, than you could by running or, or by horse. Talk about the vulnerabilities also. Is it private? Everybody else can see it. So do they? Right. And bad weather. Oh, yeah. Right. When it's raining. Or uh, somebody could sneak in and burn down one of the towers and interrupt the chain, right? Yeah, that's what they did in Lord of the Rings. Exactly. Tell me why it works. Tell me what you think is powerful about it. I was trying to get something that they could make their own, and kids learn different ways. Uh, some of them are going to learn through hearing, uh, by seeing, um, you know, even touch, but some are kinetic learners. So this is, I think, a very powerful way to kind of put a semaphore, a communication device, in action. I saw several other things going on there as well. First of all, it's got simple dramatic tension in it. You know, is the messenger going to get there on time? Because they're excited and enthusiastic, uh, it creates learning readiness. That's such a classic uh, uh, target to get kids into. What's all the planets? Uh, Jupiter. Alan's devised other activities, one involving sticking up a picture of the planets in the school car park. Did you get it yet? I didn't mark Venus. I only got Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, Earth, Neptune, Mercury, and Pluto. Is it Mars red? Because hey, Mars is missing. Mars is missing? Right. Mars is eclipsed. <laughs> Oh, so you can't see Mars? Right. Okay, so you can only see Venus. Venus? Venus, okay. that's right. Venus. Also, the telescope that you guys are looking at is much more accurate, smaller, uh, and has greater magnification than any of the ones that Galileo used. So consider what an amazing achievement it was for him to make these observations. One component of deep learning has to be engagement and focus, doesn't it? I mean, look at that group there. Yeah, give yourself a pay rise. Um, they're all absolutely focused, recording, um, getting a grasp on what's happening, and those planets out there on the fence have turned into real planets, haven't they? She's, she's, trying, she's getting readings off the planets. How did you think of that? You know, when I was reading about Galileo, um, how, what better way to do it than to walk the parking lot off and put to scale a certain number of planets just as Galileo would have seen them. And, uh, you know, have an observation sheet where they had to write down what they saw. And, you know, it was through looking at the heavens that Galileo made his discovery, so hopefully that stays with him. You have to take the whole thing off. And guys, if anybody, if anybody gets any paint on them, here's towels, but those are sealed pens, so they should be pretty straightforward. You guys can do whatever colors you want. For example, when Michelangelo was painting, the Pope asked him to paint 12 people. He wound up painting 3,000 people. So just like I'm asking you to do the assignment, you can paint it however you like. Um, I have a feeling you have paint in your hair. Well, do I really? Up. Yes, because there's paint no, right you're there. Fine. What color is it? It's pink. Oh, OK. Well, at least it's pink. <laughs> when I was reading about the Sistine Chapel and just everything I've heard about it, this is a man who worked on his back. That is Michelangelo for years and years. And uh, I thought if I brought in a rug and got him to lay down just like Michelangelo did and paint, um, it would, you know, allow them to get a taste of what it was like. They'll remember what the Sistine Chapel is, rather than me just telling them it's, you know, some guy painting a roof of a chapel somewhere. All right, guys, please be quiet. The homework that I want you guys to uh, to tackle for tonight. Oh, I gotta come on in. Stop, you um, Ryan. Guys. Yes, uh, Shay, Shay is going to pass out a homework sheet. Your homework for tonight is to review the Italy fact sheet. There will be a quiz on Thursday. A term that gets used a lot in education in UK is the idea of the, of the plenary. Uh, uh, and here's how it goes. The idea is 
uh, that in learning periods, what you remember most is what you hear at the beginning and what you hear at the end. Mm -hmm. Some of the research that I've read suggests that you increase retention by 40% by telling people what they've learned. I noticed at the end of the lesson um, that you got them together and then started talking about the homework. Now, this may be a, this may be a national difference, but I was thinking, yeah, uh, when are we going to find out what they learn, when are they going to put this into words? Does that, does that strike a resonance with you? Absolutely, yes. I, I know what you're saying to be true. And I did not do that, but uh, yeah. I, and I, I realize now, in part, why I didn't do it. A uh, little sidetracked by what we did talk about. Yeah, but that yeah. would have been a powerful way to wrap things up. <clears throat> so if you'll give me just a second here. Number two, please, I don't like competing, especially with a hoarse voice. Those of you that have your homework, Alice. please. Make sure that you pass your homework up to me. You do not have to walk it up. See you later, Kaziah. Bye-bye, Kate. Take care, Jasmine. Thanks for the homework. One of the things that we know from research in the UK is it's often people in their first three years of teaching um, who get the best grades. Um, and I also know that one of the ways that you produce this standard of work is by working... How many hours a day do you work? Wow, quite a few. Go on, put a number. Give me a number. Do the math. You know, uh, well, I get probably about three or four hours of sleep. And I'm still taking two graduate courses this semester as well, so. OK. Uh, and the weekends, what happens to you then? Uh, a lot of it is spent, well, the past couple have been uh, either sleeping off this cold or uh, working on, on schoolwork. Um, I like to get, when I get an assignment from the kids, I like to have it graded the next day, which means staying up that night to get it uh, taken care of. So by the time I take care of my daughter, uh, spend a little time with my wife, it makes for a late evening. Um, you probably can see the circles under yeah. my eyes. OK, so that's a phenomenal high level of performance for you to keep up there, isn't it? Yeah, very draining. Another day and another early start. From 5.30, buses pick up pupils from downtown and the local Steel Creek area. <laughs> Olympic doesn't have assemblies, but every day starts at 7.15 in the same way. Good morning, Olympic community of schools. It's time for our Pledge of Allegiance. Leading us this morning is Cadet Sergeant Dugas. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Day two begins with science teacher Jean Smith. She's using active learning to teach land use, and it's controversial. With 95% of exams multiple choice, the accepted approach is to teach directly to the test. Like, was this, like what does he use this for? The words, I'm not sure. Um, that probably was maybe stakes for, um, maybe for fences, do you think? Yeah, I don't it know. Could. It be, yeah, it, it probably is because look at the fences right mm -hmm. there. We have a nice variety of birds around here. Name three. Um, Fitch. Um, Robin. Robin. They don't, have, they don't have scissor tails here, do they? No. No. Oh. That over there, I don't think that's like, I don't know. It seems just like kind of scrubby wood. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Well, we might want to clear it out. We might only want to leave a few of the trees. Or maybe that could be like, yes, the land. So that could be like our recreation center and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The value of activities like this simple field trip isn't accepted automatically. It is basically. Um, a little messy, yeah. um, so that it's not kind of a nice lo logical progression, which if we had students, you know, reading a text and taking notes, you could see a nice logical, logical piece of it. So it's a little bit messy. The other thing is a lot of it is, is emphasizing student learning. Students are the ones. I'm supposed to be more of a coach, a facilitator, and that's uncomfortable. For you? for, I think, more for the students. 
they want me to teach, you know, rather than coach. So I'm trying to have a lot of the responsibility of learning on them, okay. but they have to do the digging. And how do their parents feel about it? Well, there's some there's some concern there too. Some of the parents are are fully supported, but there are some parents, especially if a student who's been an A student and thing is maybe not doing as well in my class, then there is some concern, yes. Home time's at 2.15, unless you're in the basketball team in a crunch fixture against a local school. The morning after the team's narrow one-point win, assistant basketball coach and science teacher Patrick Buker starts the day with a lesson on forensics. Yeah, they're having it. What? I don't think he's dead. He's moving. <laughs> How do you find out if he's dead? I don't know. Kick him. I don't want to touch him. Kick him. Don't kick him. He's dead. Hey, that's my favorite. Jack <laughs> Uh, okay, so now I gotta get the fingerprint off of the gun so that we can match and see if that fingerprint yeah, is the right. same fingerprint off hey, the gun here. He's got, Stick it on an index card. Yeah. He's got, on he's got work card? to do. So you guys done with him? Are we done? Bag him! Get him out of here! He relies on thinking on his feet. And recently, he struggled with his results. Okay, you got it? Police? Yeah. You guys aren't very thorough. Come on here, police. Yeah, Was there any blood splatter anywhere? Yeah. yeah. Where? Over there. Might give you an idea of which direction the, the bullet came. He must have shot him this way. Yeah. How are you going to identify him? The reason we did this is forensics is pretty much all over TV, so you guys already know a whole bunch of stuff. All right? As proven by... All I did is give you, you know, some of y'all, I did is give you a little card that said collect evidence, and there you went, doing all this stuff, looking at fingerprints, looking at dead guys, looking at this, looking at that. <laughs> Boom. All right. We found a tie that was like tied around his neck. <laughs> we found a tie. No, it was like tied around his neck. It was tied around his neck. What are we looking for? Raise your hand if you can tell me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. You guys are the CSI people. I'm just the teacher. I want to teach in an interesting and creative way and involve students. Um, but I guess I've got some pressure um, to get results. What does that feel like? What tensions is that going to create? Insurmountable pressures. <laughs> um, to try to balance the fun and the grades, um, I, I guess the answer if they're, I, is, is you really got to train them for the, the whole multitasking thing. Um, uh, here, here's your fun activities. Here's what you need to do and what you need to know. What is it like for a teacher to try to balance that? Being at the same school for 10 years, there's not very many other people that have been here for 10 years. There's a handful and you see them come and go, and a lot of it's easy to, to see, and it is that pressure. And, and they come in here and they, they leave after a year or two years. I think it's the toughest thing in teaching, is talking about changing the relationship between learners and teachers. You really have to push teachers in order to try those things because they know, and it's, it's been told, said by the, the big boss and everything else, you don't get the scores, you're not gonna have a job. They're being pulled both ways because that's all our in-services, is to teach how to do this differently and, and, and let the students take charge of how long it takes them to learn this and, and stuff like that. And so you're getting pulled that way, sounds great. The kids would like it, they would be more engaged, but we would miss half the curriculum and when the test comes, what are you gonna do? I don't know if we would miss half the curriculum, but that's what they're thinking. That's what the fear that's, is. That's what the fear is. Test scores have dipped as the changes are being introduced, and the new small school principals are feeling the pressure from those on the outside. They don't see results in things that we've already shown in our short five months in existence. 
We have increased student attendance, decreased incidence of violence. We see increased parent participation. Those kinds of things don't show up on a test. We have got to work on the transformation of teaching and learning, and we're doing that in leaps and bounds. But it's not fast enough, it's not soon enough for me. Why do you think scores might have dipped over the transition? What, technically speaking, what would be the reason for it? Well, I think that because it is so very new, mm. and because we are so very focused on developing that relationship with students, I think that our concentration may have gone but it takes a while to understand what we're about. One of the things that really could stop us, if we don't make test scores, you know, that's how we're judged. If we don't come up with the test scores and we don't come up with them quickly, we're under a very big threat of being reorganized or closed or, because it's happened to small schools across the nation already. People expect results and they see results in the form of test scores. John's last morning, but the balloons are not for him. It's Valentine's Day. Grant, Sarah, welcome. John's back with history teacher Alan, and this time he's hoping to see a plenary. Focus on me. Guys, we have a lot to cover today, so we're going to move very, very quickly. Uh, let me go ahead and get started with housekeeping. Thank you, Shay. Hate to compete with you. Really, we didn't get a good chance to review what we had done last class. What were some of the ways the semaphore system could break down? What do you guys think? Kate. You mean like break down as in not work? Or? Right, so the message for whatever reason doesn't get from point A to point B. If someone were to get the message wrong or misread it or whatever, then you could get like incorrect information and it could mess up whatever you were trying to alert them for. Okay, excellent. Uh, what do you think, Keith? Um, like, if you're going, if you have to run or whatever, and you have to go up hills and stuff, or the weather changing, I think that's hard. Right, if the weather changes, you've got snow, rain, clouds, fog, you can't get those messages back and forth. Excellent. Um, you guys did a really nice job on these. Really nice job. What was that like, looking across and seeing those planets? Anybody? Yes. I think it was fun because at first I didn't know. I thought the um, I thought the paper was on the wall or something in the side of the classroom. But when I looked at, it, I saw it was all the way across there. And I was like, imagine if we could see all the way up there. So. Right. I liked it. It's it's amazing how far you could see, and when you put the telescope in conjunction with the semaphore, you have an amazing power to, to travel long, long distances, don't you? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's talk about <coughs> the paintings. What was it like painting upside down? Well, it was really hard painting upside down because your arm would get tired and then your neck would hurt from like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Can you imagine painting like that four years or more? Four years? Four years on your back like a little turtle. <laughs> what I noticed was um, I was really interested in when you were doing the recap from the lesson last time. It, it brought back our conversation about the importance and use of plenary. And what I particularly noticed was they were still learning ready, weren't they? In fact, you were able to be quite directive and, 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 and teacherly in what you were doing, but they were hungry for what you were saying. It, it really brought it full circle, the, uh, the summary at the end, and, and actually through the parts uh, throughout the lesson, uh, really helped tie the individual pieces together in a nice little package form. Yeah. A lot of people come into this profession, work for five years, burn out, and um, uh, go off and do something else. If you were ordered to reduce your workload right now or to find ways of preventing yourself burning out, what might be the top couple of ideas that come to mind? I think uh, building up a library of work certainly helps during the first year. And then uh, organizing that into individual lesson plans and making sure that, that you've got those ready to go, you're right, that will be a big drop off. But uh, in the meantime, networking with other teachers, certainly, to get a hold of their best practices, um, 
probably will pay some dividends. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I I'm not quite sure, which makes it so hard. I don't know exactly where to cut. But, uh, I'm going to be divorced before I know it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll give her a ring. It'll be all right. Great. <laughs> okay. I'm all right. I've seen some extraordinary teaching. Great. But, you know, I've seen children lying on their backs, painting a Sistine Chapel ceiling on the bottom of, uh, of a table, staring out of a telescope at a model of the planets. Um, that kind of diversity and range of teaching stars, that, that's something that's beginning um, to happen. I'm also thinking less is more, depth over coverage. So if I get educated by you, um, I might want to really go into something and go into that something properly. That depth is more important uh, than knowing a little bit about a lot of things. But test scores are reality. They're published in the newspaper. We're judged by what they look like. We cannot, uh, we cannot ignore them. But we also cannot ignore the fact that we've got to educate our kids very differently, our students very differently than what we've done before. And, and test scores is not doing that. And the kind of teaching that will just produce test scores is not doing that. So we've got to, I think you've got to have the courage to, courage to take that leap. The second thing is the way the teachers are knocking themselves out. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ferocious work rate. Everybody I talk to here seems to get out of bed before five o'clock in the morning. Um, they all seem to be in trouble with their families because they're working until 10 o'clock at night um, and at the weekends. How do we look after them? How do we do it? It's hard. It, it's hard, and it's it, because it's hard to be in this building. It's a lot of work. What we're doing is new, and they're they're doing some pushback, probably, probably as they should do. Yeah. Um, and so, how do we find how do we find that happy medium? Is 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 difficult. I think over time we'll get better at it. It's already better now than it was at the beginning of the year, but I I think it's really critical that we find ways to support them. Mm -hmm.